This morning we're going to be studying Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I've titled this message, Solomon's Failed Experiment. In the world of scientific discovery, experimentation is critical. You have a theory, some idea about how things work. You make an educated guess based on what you already know, but then you have to test your theory. You have to try it out. It has been said that there's no such thing as a failed experiment in science. There are only experiments that yield unexpected results. Now, you and I can, with hindsight, look back on some pretty silly and costly experiments that we know now were never going to work. Right? Early attempts at human flight uh, give us plenty of examples of such experiments. In 1507, John Damien made some wings. He covered them in chicken feathers, strapped them to his arms, and jumped off the wall of Stirling Castle in Scotland. He had good information. Birds fly. Birds have feathers and wings. So if I put together some wings and some feathers, perhaps I can fly. And then he thought about it on the ground with his femur shattered, uh, about the use of feathers, you know, I've never really seen a chicken fly that far. I should have used eagle feathers. He ran up against the laws of physics. You know, thrust to weight ratios and Newton's third law and Bernoulli's principles and all the rest. We can look back through the lens of more discovery and see that that was an experiment doomed from the beginning. Bloodletting was a bad experimental procedure employed for thousands of years to combat lots of different ailments. If you had a headache or a fever, a physician would let blood out of you in order to attempt to cure these ailments. It was believed by some that the different veins and arteries in your body were connected to different internal organs. And so if one of those organs was damaged or malfunctioning, uh, you could relieve the symptoms of whatever ailment was there by letting out blood. This was done even late into the 19th century. I read this week about a man who was stabbed in a duel and he fainted for loss of blood. His physicians believed that he could be helped by bloodletting to ease his fever, to flush out infection, and over a period of a few days, more than half of the blood in his body was removed. Amazingly, he recovered, and the medical journals, uh, the physician published his case and gave credit to his recovery for the practice of bloodletting. You and I have no need to repeat experiments like these. Man's early attempts at flight or dark ages medical practices. You and I can see clearly from our vantage point that those experiments were doomed from the beginning. Now, this morning we're going to look at Solomon's experiment. It is Solomon's experiment with pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure. Maybe that's where meaning is found. Maybe the, that's the answer to the meaning of life. If, if the meaning of life is elusive and, and all these people who are pursuing pleasure seem to be happy, may, maybe that's where meaning is to be found. Solomon has posited the question of the problem of life in Ecclesiastes 1.3. He says, what profit is there for a man in all of his labors under the sun? What gain? What benefit? And after declaring the futility of all of it in chapter 1, verses 4 to 11, and then in chapter 2, proving his credentials to make such a claim, at the end of chapter 1. In chapter 2, he now begins to rehearse for us how he came to his conclusion. That all of it under the sun was futility. And this begins in chapter 2 with his grand experiment to see if he could find the meaning of life in the pursuit of pleasure. So let's together watch the preacher king put on the white laboratory coat of scientific inquiry as he runs his tests on pleasure to see if they are the key to the meaning of life. Let's read together Ecclesiastes 2, 1 to 11. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness and of pleasure. What does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine, while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works. 
I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. But then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities, which my hands had done, and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Will you pray with me? God, we come to this, your word with a heart eager for you to do in us what must be done. To unravel the, the tangled tendencies and temptations in our own hearts and minds where we are tempted to believe and fall for the deception that this cursed world, this world bent on its own destruction, offers with all of its lies, with all of its empty promises. I pray, O oh God, that we would heed the words of this section of your word, that we would watch Solomon's failed experiment and not imitate it, that we would be removed of the need to try what he tried. O oh God, may we trust you the way Solomon should have, May we be acquainted with your ways the way Solomon should have been. And God, may we find our joy, our delight, our pleasure, our meaning, our fulfillment, our satisfaction in you and you alone. We ask that you would use this text to root out those things in our hearts which must be dispensed with and to replace them with an unquenchable desire for you and a love for all that brings you glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I do believe that there is such a thing as a failed experiment. In my book, a failed experiment is an experiment in which you knew the outcome would be self-destructive, unproductive, misery-inducing, and incalculably costly. But you go through with it anyway. Solomon's experiment with pleasure was going to be a failure. It was a bust from the beginning. Solomon had to know that it would fail, but he jumped in with everything that he had. And the tragedy for us is that we have seen this same experiment fail again and again and again. In fact, we have never seen it succeed. And we are tempted again and again to try it out. And I have gotten wind that some of you are guessing which 20th century music I might make reference to each week as we go through Ecclesiastes. This morning, I'm going to get the poetry out of the way at the beginning. It should come as no surprise that I might employ the lyrical genius of Keith Richards and Mick Jagger. Their Solomonic musings went something like this, and you have to love the almost Shakespearean magnificence of the vocabulary, the, the rhythmical, rhythmical, I can't even say the words, I'm mocking them. <laughs> There's no soaring imagery here. The poetry goes like this. I can't get no satisfaction. And I try. And I try. And I try. And I try. And I guess there's parallelism, right? I can't get no. That song was released in 1965. The Rolling Stones are playing this year in Las Vegas. And they are said to have played that song at every single concert. What does that tell us? <laughs> They're still trying. And they still can't get no satisfaction. Now, Solomon's experiment went awry from the beginning, not because he ran up against the laws of physics or the basic principles of medical physiology, 
but because he ran headlong against the reality of a post-fall universe. Satisfaction cannot be had under the sun. A universe that's populated by sinners who have rebelled against their maker, they've made a mess out of their existence. A world that is bent by God, cursed by him, so that it cannot yield to mankind what was originally intended. A creation frustrated on purpose with the intent to lift our gaze above the horizontal. I want to give you a heads up this morning. I I intend to use discretion in the things we'll talk about this morning. You moms and dads sitting with your young-eared progeny at your side, I want you to know that I will not say everything this morning that probably needs to be said from this text. There's probably a place, there's probably a time, uh, maybe an equipping hour class someday in the future where we unpack over eight weeks Solomon's failed experiments and all of its details and all of its implications. I just want you to know that I don't want to introduce anything from here this morning that would be at odds with your own discretion and your own timing in parenting your children. But parents, you're not off the hook. You may have some splaining to do when you get home. And you have to be proactive, you have to be intentional in bringing up the subject matter that God's word touches on in this passage. If you want some help in thinking through how to do that, let me invite you to talk to those who have already walked down that path. Uh, Let me invite you to speak to any of the pastors, any of the elders uh, here at Grace Bible Church. We would love to help you think through how to introduce some of these things to your kids appropriately and in a timely way. Every element of Solomon's experiment here is worth its own sermon. Uh, We're not going to take eight weeks to do this. We're going to cram eight sermons into one this morning. Every one of these needs to be looked at, turned over thoroughly. Let me give you the main point. It is going to be up on the screen for you. Solomon tried and failed to find the meaning of life in pleasure. Solomon tried and failed to find the meaning of life in pleasure. And this comes from verse 1. Read this with me. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it was futility. Solomon gives us the experiment, the procedures, and the results all up front. And he begins by saying, I said to myself, literally, I said to my heart. Heart, inner person, and all that makes up who I am, I'm going to test you. And I'm going to test you with pleasure. The word for testing here is an ongoing trial intended to bring about an intended result. This is an experiment on himself. Solomon is playing both scientist and lab rat. And it is pleasure that he is going to engage with. Gladness, mirth, we might say fun. And so he commands himself, enjoy, go, see the good, literally. Solomon does not take fun lightly. He's not here recreating on the weekends as a distraction from his nine-to-five employment. I saw a meme this week that said, the hardest days of the week are the five days following the weekend. (laughs) Right? That, That reflects the song. Everybody's working for the weekend. Most of us think about fun, pleasure, delight, recreation as the kinds of things we do after we do our chores. Solomon's chore in life was to try to extract from fun, from pleasure, the very essence of life. He is fully occupied, fully engaged, 24-7, 365, with everything that he has, all that he is, into this test. We might call this scientific hedonism. A disciplined, diligent, eyes-open study with every resource available of fun. Solomon has his lab coat on, his clipboard in his hand. His laboratory is the world. Pleasure is in the Petri dish, and his own heart is under the microscope. He will run every test and try every angle to see if pleasure and fun can produce the profit, the lasting gain, the enduring meaning that he is hunting for. And what did he find in verse 1? Behold. (laughs) Behold. Check this out. It is futility. And there's that Hebrew word we've been talking about, hevel, that there for a moment but vanishes in an instant. Emptiness, transitory, fleeting, worthlessness. It is like the steam off the top of a cup of coffee. It's there for a moment and then it is gone. Just when you think you could see it, just when you think you could grasp it, it is vanished. 
This is what Solomon has set his heart to. What a tragic compromise. What should he have set his heart on? Psalm 119, 2. How blessed or how happy are those who observe God's testimonies, who seek God with all their heart. Listen, Solomon could have abandoned the experiment from the beginning, read the Bible, sought God, and had the answer to the question. His tragic failure is a lesson for us we must not miss. I just wish he could have taken the shortcut. Let's look together at the eight elements of Solomon's failed experiment. The first one is comedy. Can the pleasure of laughter bring meaning to life? Look at verse 2. I said of laughter, so this is his test, <laughs> and he gives us the conclusion right away, it's maddening or it's madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? Sometimes this word for laughter is used of derision, of mocking, of making fun of other people, ridicule. Um, here, I think more broadly, it includes those things, but just has the, the general meaning of laughter, all kinds of laughter. What is it that's going to make me smile, to, to chuckle, to guffaw? To laugh till it hurts, to laugh till I cry. And when I recover, is there someone who can make me laugh some more? We have television show genre called, I just forgot what it's called. What's it called? Situation, what is it? I, a sitcom. I had the abbreviation, but not the whole word. I, I got to sit in on a sitcom in high school as a field trip. And, and they held up signs and told us when to laugh. You, you, you probably watched the show and heard my voice on that show. This is in the 90s. And that was me chuckling only when the green light came on and they told me to. Solomon is hoping that someone can make him laugh. And maybe the smile on his face will be a key to the meaning in life. And you know the people who have sought to be the life of the party, always cracking a joke, maybe poking fun at others. The person with a quick wit, always with a gleam in her eye when the opportunity arises to make others smile. I think I understand the temptation to find the meaning of life there. You see, smiley, happy people give the impression of having found the meaning of life. When, when all you see is the party and everybody laughing, that's it, right? That little vanishing moment, that, that, that has to be what it's all about. And Solomon says, it is maddening. Now, what does this accomplish? It doesn't take long to contemplate the tragedies of our comedians. The recent suicide of Robin Williams comes to mind. To help us understand what Solomon is getting at here. Those who have made their lives about either hiding behind humor or trying to make others laugh often live the most dark existences on the planet. Laughter and partying and giddiness are often a mask for the inner turmoil of an unsatisfied longing for transcendent realities. And comedy whitewashes the pain of living in a broken world with a thin veneer of laughter. The answer to brokenness will not be found there. And Solomon has not found what he is looking for. And he moves on in verse 3 to the second test. It's alcohol. He says there in verse 3, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely. How to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Solomon probably, after the party was over and all the chuckles were done, he, he, he looked over and saw a beer commercial. You've seen those, I'm sure. You think, man, those people have what I've been missing. Those people in the beer commercial, they're, they're quality people. They're all in shape. They're active. They're, they're having fun. They're enjoying each other's company. Maybe I've been a little too straight-laced, a little too prudish. I need to loosen up a little. Maybe meaning in life is going to be found in a bottle. They all seem to be enjoying themselves, and they look like they found the answer. And notice these key phrases in verse 3. Solomon says, I explored with my mind, while my mind was guiding me, until I could see. Solomon is not unconscious here. Again, this is part of his eyes open, deliberate experiment. Solomon wants something like a sober drunkenness. He wants to study the effects of inebriation 
Why? Not, not because he wants to escape reality, but he wants to find reality. He wants to see if meaning can be found in getting high or getting low, getting buzzed, getting stoned, getting drunk. And Solomon, the most astute man to have ever lived, wants to apply his genius to a rationally controlled indulgence of mind-altering substance. This is not passionless, disinterested, mindless stupor. He's at the party, still in his laboratory coat, with yet another wine glass in one hand and taking notes on his clipboard with the other. Some drink at parties and some drink alone. Some drink to escape life and some drink to try to find life. The escapist drunk has already admitted that life is broken and bent. And the partying drunk still believes the lie that real life is to be found under the sun. Both have turned to alcohol to look for what they will not find. And when the chemical effects wear off, the drinker is left with less than he started. Solomon knew this. He wrote about it in Proverbs 20, verse 1. He says, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler. Whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Here's Solomon in all of his wisdom saying, what I did is not wise. And yet in his experiment, he's saying, my mind guided me wisely <laughs> into drunkenness. I think we need to understand that Solomon has gotten loose with the wisdom word group here. The whole idea of, of wisdom has gotten flimsy in Solomon's language. Proverbs begins and Ecclesiastes ends with wisdom being defined this way, the fear of the Lord, right? It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the end of wisdom. And really everything in between for real wisdom. But Solomon here, in his under-the-sun pursuit of the meaning of life, is willing to use the words wise and wisdom much more loosely than those definitions. The definitions he himself gives, the beginning and the end. And it's not uncommon for the Bible to use the word wisdom to describe things that are less than the fear of the Lord. Listen to Exodus 1.10. The ruler of Egypt, who did not know Joseph, who enslaved the Israelites, who did not fear God, said, let us deal wisely with them meaning let us make slaves out of them all. 2 Samuel 13, 3, we read this. Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very wise man. Same word. It's translated oftentimes shrewd. Jonadab is the one that came up with the plan for Amnon to violate his sister. This is not fear of the Lord, wisdom. But an under the sun, shrewdness, acuity, or insight... And the word wisdom can have a range of meanings. I believe Solomon here in this part of Ecclesiastes is intentionally flexing that range of meaning. Because you and I are tempted to use the wrong definition of wisdom, to follow the wisdom of this world, to try to get meaning out of life. The, even the word philosophy is the uh, sophos. Logos, it's the, or the philos sophos, it's the love of wisdom. And yet, how much of the world's wisdom is grounded in fear of the Lord? <laughs> Very little. Solomon wants us to despair of this kind of wisdom. This under the sun kind of wisdom that only leads to emptiness. And notice how he closes verse 3. The few years of their lives. He takes us back to our mortality. To the brevity of life. Even here, even before we get to the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, Solomon's real eternal perspective is invading his description of this experiment. Like narrow shafts of sunlight piercing an otherwise dark and ominous sky. It's a reminder, well before Solomon gets to the end of his sermon, that death is coming. However long you live, whatever fun you're allowed to pursue, an assessment is on the way. Judgment is coming. Solomon, in alcohol, has not found what he is looking for. Maybe the meaning of life is to be found in the next test, home improvement. Read with me verses 4 through 6. I enlarged my works. 
I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. Houses, vineyards, gardens, parks, retention ponds for irrigating everything. These are monumental construction projects on Solomon's home or what he considered his home. I want to zero in on one word here. The word parks is the Hebrew word paradise, and it's pronounced paradise. (laughs) It's probably a Persian loan word, and it has the meaning of of an enclosed garden. What is that all about? an enclosed garden that's called paradise. Solomon is trying to recreate Eden in an east of Eden world. He's trying to undo or ameliorate the curse for himself through home improvement, building things for himself, enlarging things for himself, making it beautiful. Even the vocabulary here of trees with fruit, all of that comes right out of Genesis chapter 2. The same vocabulary, same words used to describe the Garden of Eden, Solomon here uses to describe his own home improvement projects. I don't know if you've done that in your own third of an acre. (laughs) Try to recreate some semblance of the Garden of Eden. It it won't obey. (laughs) At least mine doesn't obey. What is Solomon doing here? He's trying to get what cannot be had. Joy, satisfaction, meaning, happiness out of a cursed and broken world. And it, and it won't be had. Notice, too, Solomon's abject selfishness. He, he hasn't built public works here. He spent more time on his own house than he did on the temple. He says over and over again, I built these things for myself. These are my works, houses for myself, vineyards for myself, garden and parks for myself. Ponds of water for myself. Consider the cost of Solomon's selfish experiment to the nation. He wasn't going to find meaning there. Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden for a reason. (laughs) They weren't allowed to have unmediated fellowship with God or a perfect relationship to the created order while there was sin. And Solomon couldn't get it for himself either. Maybe there's something to be had in possessions. Test number four, verses seven and eight. I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. This is the test of pleasure in possessions. This is Solomon's unbridled consumerism. And it begins by saying, I bought slaves, male and female slaves. Think about this. Solomon, in order to get everything that he wanted, purchased people. An army of people to to do his bidding. And to those slaves were born slaves in his own household. People born into being possessed by another man, owned by another man for that man's whims and that man's desires. He possessed people. With the snap of his fingers, he could get whatever he wanted. Again, consider the cost of this experiment in terms of the lives of humanity. The humanity Solomon was intended to serve. His own nation, he's in, supposed to lead Godward. What did he ask for wisdom for in the beginning to begin with? I'm too young. I don't have discernment. I need to know how to rule these people well, and I need to know right from wrong. He failed on every account. And he was to lead Israel to show forth the greatness of Yahweh so that the surrounding nations would come and worship the one true God. His life is a failure at these things. All so that he could test out his own personal pleasure with whatever he wanted, anytime he wanted to have it. Flocks and herds. Could you imagine a shopping spree on Solomon's budget? You see it, you get it. He says, I accumulated for myself silver and gold, the treasures of kings and provinces. Whatever some king had, Solomon was going to add that little bit to his vast collection. It was like the British Museum in Jerusalem. 
All the great treasures from all over the world now belong to him. It became a display case for the best things the world had to offer. But Solomon didn't just collect stuff as a pack rat. Remember that his unbridled consumerism was part of his experiment to find transcendent meaning in life. You know that feeling deep inside you when you set your heart on something that you don't yet have? A new house, a new car, a new pair of shoes, a new iPhone, a a new book, a new power drill, whatever it is. (laughs) You imagine what it will be like to have that thing when it satisfies all your earthly desires, fixes all of your problems. If I I just get that thing, my collection will be complete. Satisfaction will be mine. I can finally arrive if I just have that next technological gadget. I'm there if I get that perfect pair of jeans. I've heard that's a thing. The answer here to Solomon's quest is not mere contentment with what you already possess. We, We fall way short if we think the answer to Solomon's problem is just be content with what you have. We need a solution much better than contentment with our present possessions because the problem of possessions is much bigger than discontentment. You see, a man with three things can envy a man with a hundred things because he believes those things can bring him happiness. But the man with only three things can choose to be content with what he has and still believe that those three things can bring him happiness. He might not covet, he might not steal the other guy's stuff, but he's still a slave to the deception that transcendent satisfaction can be found in things that moth and rust destroy. You and I need to adjust our appetites, our expectations. We need to repent of falling for the delusion that possessions have the capacity to bring lasting satisfaction. Possessions don't possess that power. Only God can supply what we're looking for. We actually need to be wary of our possessions. Who possesses whom? Who is telling whom what to do? Do my possessions or the possessions I wish I had actually own me? Solomon, after testing comedy and alcohol and home improvement and possessions, still has not found what he's looking for. And he turns his investigative attention next to entertainment. It's also found in verse 8. I provided for myself male and female singers. Now, this was uncommon in Solomon's day. Uh, the, The purpose for male and female singers becomes clear when we understand that only male choirs served musically in the temple and the tabernacle in Israel's history. Uh, The purpose for male and female singers in this context is strictly entertainment. Entertainment. And Solomon had access to the best musicians playing for his pleasure. Can you imagine the conversations between uh, the, the top artists? They talk about the last tour they did. Hey, where'd you go on tour last? Oh, yeah, I, I played Solomon's Palace. And then I played Solomon's Cabin in the Woods. And, and then I played his dinner table. And then I played his backyard barbecue. And then I had that wedding gig. Oh, yeah, whose wedding was it? Uh, Solomon's. Uh, yeah, which one? I think it was number 584. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. I don't remember the bride's name, but the cake was exquisite. Can you imagine having at your dinner table the best music played and sung by the best musicians live every night? Having the best seat to every great concert, every fine performance. Solomon exhausted the ability of entertainment to provide the meaning of life. Listen, he didn't go to concerts to tune in and drop out. Solomon pursued entertainment with a vengeance. His was an earnest, invested, exhaustive inquiry into whether entertainment could supply what everything he'd looked at before couldn't. But the music wore out. Those great new songs got old. You know, that favorite song can't captivate your attention forever. You need something fresh to make you feel like you did the the fleeting moment when that favorite song was new. And after you've tried all the songs, 
when every new song begins to sound like every other song, you realize that you can try and try and try and try and still get no satisfaction here. And like every previous element of this experiment, entertainment failed Solomon's test. He still has not found what he's looking for. Maybe the answer is found in number six, romantic intimacy. He says, I provided for myself the pleasures of men, many concubines. I will be discreet here. Although I believe that we need to spend much more time than I will give here to this topic. Today's culture feels to me like a runaway train racing, accelerating towards disaster in this area. That we are in desperate need of carefully contemplating the results of Solomon's failed experiment. The Hebrew here is, I provided for myself concubine and concubines. Uh, Sort of a Hebrew way to say multiplied concubines. And C.J. Mahaney once said, the hardest theological question you will ever be asked by your kids is, hey dad, what's a concubine? In the context of ancient Near Eastern royal household, a concubine was considered part of the royal family, of a higher class than the hoi polloi and the common citizenry, but of a lower status than a wife. And a concubine's purpose in the household was specifically to fulfill the conjugal cravings of the king. 1 Kings 11.3 tells us Solomon's story. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I'm not sure how a wife in such a household would feel very much different than a concubine. If, if you were wife number one or number 673, what kind of a wife are you really? Do you see how far off Solomon is? How far off the reservation he has wandered? Genesis and Jesus agree that a marriage is beautiful and good and intimacy in a marriage between one man and one woman for life is a glorious thing. Deuteronomy 17, 17 gives this command to kings over Israel. He shall not multiply wives for himself. Solomon has violated the model and the prescriptions for what marriage is supposed to be. For what romantic intimacy is supposed to be like. And the point of Solomon's mention of his provision for unlimited sexual exploits is simple. The meaning of life is not to be found in sex In the next romantic encounter, no matter how hard our world tries to convince us that that is the best place to look. Technology today allows for electronic access to this experiment in Solomonic proportions, right in your pocket. I hope that you're doing everything that you should to unmask the deception that satisfaction can be found in just one more intimate experience. You and I need not repeat Solomon's failed investigation. Solomon exhausted this avenue of inquiry, and he did it with the express purpose of trying to find life and meaning in it. The result of his compromise was pain, shame, idolatry, the plunging of the entire nation into wickedness, division, civil war, captivity, and exile. Not just a train wreck, but a world wreck at Solomon's hand with his failure in this area. And if you've toyed with the same experiment, though without the brains, the opportunities, and the financial backing that Solomon had at his disposal, you already know the destruction and pain that follow in its wake. Romantic intimacy outside of God's gift and God's plan can never deliver on what it promises. Is there something else that can? Test number seven, verse nine, reputation. Then I became great and I increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom stood by me. Solomon thought, well, what what if I'm just the best? (laughs) Maybe meaning is found in what other people think of me and how how others perceive me and how I rank amongst my contemporaries. Maybe meaning is found in my legacy. And notice what Solomon says, my wisdom also stood by me. 
Literally, wisdom took its stand with me in my investigation. Solomon never got distracted. He was not deterred. He was, in fact, determined to see this experiment through, to test every variable one at a time, to employ a shrewd insight, to investigate every nook and cranny of life under the sun, to answer the question, what profit? What is to be gained? What can I get that will last? And the last category in verse 10 is the catch-all. If these first seven categories have overlooked something, Solomon wants to assure us that he has overlooked nothing. His last test is any conceivable source. Look at verse 10. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. He did not refuse, he did not withhold, and he says, I earned it. This was my reward for my labor. I worked hard to squeeze pleasure out of every conceivable possible option. And look what he says, my heart was pleased. We can't say of Solomon, well, you just looked in the wrong places. You didn't look hard enough or you didn't do it quite right. He, he actually says, I was pleased. I found pleasure in all of these things. And the pleasure I found in these things wasn't enough. He got all that the world had to offer. 1 John 2.16 says it this way, All that is in the world under the sun, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, this is Solomon's biography. It's not from the Father, but is from the world. Listen, if we think that maybe just Solomon got the proportions wrong. He did all of this in excess, and what he really needed was balance. He'll get to that later in Ecclesiastes. He'll dismantle that as well. Simplicity is not the answer. What are the results of Solomon's experiment? How does he conclude it? What, are, what is his published findings in the scientific journal? Vanity, chasing wind, no profit. That's Solomon's conclusion. He restates here the results of his experiment. This is the publishing of his findings. If, if it had a title in a scientific journal, it might be something like this. Phloxy Nasi Nihilopilification, a systematic inquiry into everything. It's one of the longest words in the English language. You can look it up later. It simply means the estimation of something as nothing. <laughs> he piles up terms here. He calls it vanity. That's our word, hevel, again transitory emptiness. And he calls it striving after wind, trying to get satisfaction, meaning, and life out of pleasure. It's a futile exercise. And he says it is profitless. The great big question, where am I going to find profit for everything done under the sun? Not here. What must, have been, what must it have been like when Solomon realized the experiment had failed? Imagine him, the king, sitting around all day having a huge party with all of his friends, every day indulging in every sort of entertainment, every pleasurable desire, live concerts, all the alcohol you could drink, the best foods imaginable, people eating till they were stuffed, drinking till they puked, laughing till it hurt all the time. Think about what it must have been like for Solomon the day that it all came to an end the half-eaten filet mignon resting on his solid gold plate, his cherry coke still audibly fizzing in his solid gold goblet, the remnants of his strawberry pie still on his gold fork and sliding slowly down his curly beard onto his new silk shirt. The thought suddenly strikes him that this is all vanity. I've been chasing wind. There's no profit here. The meaning of life wasn't in the party. It wasn't in all those romantic strolls with all my lovers through my Edenic gardens. It wasn't in fame or fortune or renown or reputation. It wasn't in the bottle. It wasn't in any of the pursuits that I gave myself up to. And as he reflects on this failed experiment, the music still plays in the background, but it has lost its edge. The entertainers continue their acts, but they no longer entertain. The servants continue to bring out the food, but it just doesn't taste good anymore. The jokers tell their jokes. But they all seem old and canned. 
We can't out Solomon, Solomon and his experiment to trying to find meaning under the sun. You and I must learn to be wary of pleasure. <laughs> There's a discipline in refusing what our eyes desire and what our heart longs for. And while we must be wary of pleasure, I believe at the same time we must long for it. We have to be wary of the suicidal danger of the pursuit of pleasure for itself. But we are to worship God with the understanding that Solomon forgot. The understanding that his own dad preached, Psalm 1611, at God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, under the sun, pleasures numb us to eternal realities. They dull our spiritual senses. And when we chase pleasure under the sun, it will only prove to be a cheap imitation of what we were built for. A deception, a distraction. Why is it that Mick Jagger still can't get no satisfaction? Because he has committed his life to looking for it under the sun. If you want proof of that, you can look up the lyrics to his song, Can't Make a Saint Out of Me, or Never Make a Saint Out of Me. He has a remarkable understanding of New Testament theology that he quotes in that song, and he rejects it. He rejected the true source of pleasure, and he has wasted his life looking for it where it cannot be found. Listen, a Christian is no longer a slave to that fruitless pursuit. What we're coming to in this book is a recalibration of fun and pleasure and delight and meaning. And we're going to put it under the banner of worship. That's coming in this book. Again, the theme that I would put on this sermon from Solomon is that you cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. But if you ground your enjoyment in Him, then there are things to enjoy in this life for what they are. It is when we get these things out of proportion and we seek the enjoyment for itself. And we begin to worship the created thing rather than the creator that we fail at the very thing Solomon is warning us about. How do we know if these priorities are upside down for us? How do you test your heart? I would suggest that you put your heart in a Petri dish under the microscope when things are bad. <laughs> When things aren't going well, when, when you don't have what you want, when you're uncomfortable, when health is bad, relationships are broken, things are rusting. Do you look under the sun for remedy or reprieve from the curse? Are you trying to look for the answers here? They will not be found. And test your heart when things are good. When your health is great, your kids obey, when your cars all work, when things aren't falling apart and, and projects that you do stay done. When you've cleaned the dishes and nobody's dirtied them. Are you longing for heaven in that moment? You see, I think even God's good gifts, if misunderstood, numb and dull our senses towards eternal things. My friends, this ought not be. Anything good in this life ought to be a preminder of what is to come and what God has promised. And we make it an idol. We, we slot it into the category of Solomon's failed experiment for meaning and pleasure when we see it as something other than God's good gift that depends on God's giving our ability to appreciate it, to go along with it. We'll get to Solomon saying, who can eat and who can enjoy apart from him? Solomon's going to give us a theology of fun, a theology of pleasure. But you must know that our appetites, if they're fixed horizontally under the sun, they will never give us what pleasure was designed to give us, what God designs pleasure for. We have a rule in our house, no crying when the fun is over. I don't know if you've ever had to institute that regulation. We're having a great time, but you know it's time to stop and go do other things. I don't want to stop. Wait a second. Were you just having fun? Mission accomplished. <laughs> but you can't cry when the fun is over. I believe we are too tied to temporal delights. 
We forget who we are. We forget what we were built for. And our appetites are wrong. I believe this book, Ecclesiastes, this sermon from Solomon, Solomon is in your Bible to get you to long for heaven, to loosen your grip on the trinkets and trash of this temporary existence, to set your gaze above the sun, S-U-N, and to fix your gaze on the S-O-N, sun. I want you to flip forward to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. I want you to see a contrast of appetites based on a contrast of identities that reflect, I think, exactly what Solomon is getting at here. Paul says in verse 17 of Philippians 3, Brethren, Christians, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us, that is, Paul and his ministry companions. For many walk of whom I have often told you, and I now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame, and they set their minds on earthly things. Paul here is talking about influential people who had been in the church at Philippi that Philippian believers were tempted to follow. And they were preaching a message of of happiness now. Your best life now, no suffering. Paul says, don't listen to them. Follow my example. Follow our example. Who, who have, we've taken up our cross to follow Christ. There, there's a suffering that's inherent in being a Christian. Don't follow these guys who are slaves to their own appetites. What are they worshiping? Whatever they set their eyes upon, whatever their hearts desires. This is Solomon's experiment. And these are pseudo-Christians. They're no real Christians. Paul tells us there the end is destruction. But they've had an influence on the Philippian church. Paul's not warning the Philippian believers about the world out there, but about people who have sold a a message of pseudo-Christianity with your happiness now tied to it. They've flipped over Philippians 1.21, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. They've said, for me... Well, to die is Jesus. I'll have Jesus when I die. I've tacked him on to the end of my life. But to live is gain. Uh, That New Testament word for profit. Uh, They've got their appetites all wrong. That it ends in destruction. And a contrast to a believer in verses 20 and 21 is a contrast of their appetites and a contrast of their identity. Look what Paul says. For our citizenship is in heaven. Do you realize you belong by citizenship, by new birth and by the blood of Jesus to a place you have never yet been? That's home. That's home. We've never yet seen it, but we are governed by its principles and we love its king. We can't wait to be there because Jesus is there. Paul even says our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We love heaven because Jesus is there. We can't wait to be there because he's there and he's our treasure. He's the source of infinite delight and he has promised it to all who believe in him. And look at the promise that comes with it in verse 21. Jesus himself will transform the body of our humble state. (laughs) Listen to the existence we have now in a cursed and broken world. Into conformity with the body of his glory. How will he do that? With the power that he has to subject all things to his own authority. (laughs) It's a lot of power to get Satan to bow the knee and confess that he's Lord. To get all the host of demons to say he truly is God. And for every enemy, every spiritual and human authority to obey his every word, Jesus has that power. And with that power, he will usher his own from this under the sun existence safely into our heavenly home. It's where we belong. Christian, it's where your heart is. It's where your home is. If you're here this morning, And you are still enslaved 
to Solomon's failed experiment. Can I give you Jesus' words here? From Matthew 5, verse 6. He said, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Listen, Jesus came from heaven to die on a cross, to pay for our sins, to make us right with God, not just so that we get a blank slate, look, my sins are taken care of, I've been declared righteous. That's not the end. (laughs) He gives us forgiveness of sin so that we have free access to him. And listen, if you have not yet surrendered to Christ, you've been thinking that meaning and satisfaction and pleasure and delight can be found in the things that he's made when all they are are indicators that he's the source of pleasure and you were built for pleasure and it's only going to be found and satisfied when it is found in him. And you have opportunity even this day for your life to change forever. For the futile hunt to be over. For the chasing after wind and all of the vanity to come to an end and for you to find life. Would you turn to Jesus today? I'll be here. Others will be around to talk to you. If you, if you want to talk to somebody about what it means to have eternal life and to end the futile hunt for the needle in a haystack when there's no needle in the great big haystack, talk to somebody today about what it means to know God through Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words, for your word, for the record of Solomon's failed experiment. If anything anything good could come from such a miserable compromise, such an awful tragedy, such a worthless endeavor, oh God, I pray that it would do the good in us that we so desperately need to loosen our grip on temporal things, to cease striving for meaning under the sun, to anchor our hearts and our affections on you and you alone, and to find in you all that we've been looking for, to long for heaven, to long to be home with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.